um, this one is how to run for public office. Uh, I would really love to see President Delaney, uh, Governor Kushida, uh, you name it, uh, in, in the future. We think that this is an opportunity for, for all of us to learn what it's like for real to run for public office uh, and to talk with people who are, have been there and done that or are doing that right now. Uh, so, so a cool event and I'm going to turn it over to Melanie, but also give a plug for our next uh, science to policy certificate class, which will be taught in the fall. So I invite you to, to like, take a look at those flyers that will be coming out and uh, sign up if you've not done so in the, in the past and uh, come and join us and be part of our science to policy team. Melanie. Thanks so much, Susan. Hi, uh, everyone. My name is Melanie Kashida. I'm a sixth year PhD candidate in sociology. I actually also just finished the certificate course last quarter. Um, and I'm a member of the Science of Policy program where I help on the curriculum and events committee. And I helped organize this event um, in collaboration with the School of Public Policy. So it's great to have everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And I can get things started off by introducing our two guest speakers, Lloyd Levine and Michaela Tong. Um, and then I'll hand it over to them to talk a little bit more about their experience and their insight in running for public office. And then after that, I'll split the audience in half for breakout groups to have a more in-depth discussion with both of our speakers. So our first guest speaker is Lloyd Levine, who is a former member of the California State Legislature, where he served as chair of the Assembly Committee on Utilities and Commerce. Currently, Mr. Levine serves as T-Mobile for government's national senior executive for state government strategy and is a senior policy fellow at the UC Riverside School of Public Policy. Growing up the son of a political consultant, Mr. Levine's roots in electoral politics date back to his childhood. In addition to being a candidate for the state legislature, Mr. Levine has worked on multiple ballot measures and served as part of the democratic leadership in the state assembly. He most recently served as a senior policy and strategic advisor on California Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis' campaign. Our second speaker, Michaela Tonkin, had the privilege of growing up in Incline Village, having left to attend the University of Colorado Boulder, where she earned a BS and MS in business administration and emphasizing in accounting. She continued her education at Brown University, where she earned an MA in urban education policy. Michaela works with state policymakers across the country on education funding and resource allocation. Michaela loves the community she grew up in and is excited to be back. She currently coaches the We the People team at Incline High School and serves as a board member for the Incline Education Foundation. Michaela was elected to serve a four year term on the board of trustees in 2020. So thank you so much, Michaela and Lloyd, for being here today to talk to our students and faculty and staff about running for public office. Um, so now I can turn it over to Lloyd um, to talk about what inspired you to run for office and your experience in running for public office. Sure. Uh, and before we get started, I love the area Michaela grew up in, too. I'm in Sacramento, so it's uh, about 100 miles, and it's one of my most favorite places on Earth. So I'm kind of jealous that she gets to live there full time. Um, so why, so running for office, what inspired me? Well, I mean, I have to, and, and you kind of said it in my bio, you have to go back to the beginning. I was in my first campaign headquarters when I was four years old. My dad was a political consultant and around our dinner table, and I know this sounds cliche, we talked about policy and politics. That was just the, kind of the conversation. And what really interested me was not politics. Politics to me is an ends to a means. I like public policy. I like crafting public policy. I like you know, helping solve problems. But in order to do that, you either have to you know, go into the bureaucracy, which is a viable option, or you decide you go into electoral politics. Now, you know, I guess a lot of people in life follow in the footsteps of their parents. And while my dad never ran for office, I was constantly exposed to elected officials. Um, and when I went to Riverside originally, my bachelor's degree is actually in photography. We can have a whole conversation about that some other time. Um, and it really does serve a purpose. That's an aside. It does serve the, the photography background has served me my entire life um, because it's allowed me to bring a level of creativity to the problem solving both inside the legislature and in my job now. That's a different topic for a different day, the role of creativity and problem solving. Um, but um, 
I, uh, you know, when I went to Riverside and realized I wasn't going to become a commercial photographer, I had to figure out what I was going to do. So, you know, I decided while I was figuring it out, maybe I should get a master's degree. Um, so I came to Sacramento because it was the closest to Cal State Sacramento, right next to the state capitol. I love state politics, particularly, again, my dad wasn't a federal consultant. I, I grew up in and around state and local politics, and I like state politics. So that's what I gravitated towards. And I got here and I started working for the state first and then some jobs opened up in the legislature and I moved over and started working for the legislature in my mid uh, 20s and I loved it. It was great. I just left grad school, started working for the legislature and it was great. Um, and very quickly I moved up and in my, I, I spent two years working for one person and then uh, a guy I knew from Southern California got elected and mine is not I mean, except for my age, mine's not an, an unusual story of how this sort of happens to a degree. Um, you know, I worked for, for a, an assembly member from the Inland Empire, as a matter of fact, John Longville, those of you who know Rialto. Um, and so I worked for him. And when I was there, um, I, I really liked John. And because we had a pre-existing relationship, it actually made the staff member relationship a little bit better. But every so often, I would get really frustrated at him. And I just like, I just, I, I, I just like, I want to do this. I want to do this. And there were things that I wanted to accomplish that he didn't. And I still have a great relationship. This is no knock on him. And so I decided I wanted to do it. Now, a lot of staff don't. A lot of staff will tell you I have no desire to run for office whatsoever, but I did. And I was 29, maybe 30 years old. And I looked around and I thought I could do this job better than a good number of people who are here. And I thought, boy, that's really arrogant. But then I also thought, gosh, if you can't legitimately say that to yourself, then you probably shouldn't run for office. Um, and it wasn't really about power. It was really about like, there's so many things I could do if I were sitting in that chair. Um, and so I, I, that's, that's how I made that decision. And then I did what the son of any political consultant would do. I called my dad and said, I wanna run for office. Um, and we had the conversation about that. Um, so that was kind of why, why I did it is, you know, my entire life, I guess, you know, I talked about the political side of things. But the non-political side of things is, um, you know, I've always been a, a joiner, um, someone who gets involved. Uh, you know, I used to, when I was in high school, I would volunteer to coach youth sports. I had a friend who was killed by a drunk driver when I was in high school, and we founded one of the first Students Against Drunk Driving chapters. And so I was on the board of that chapter when I was in high school. At Riverside, you know, I, would, I, I volunteered for local politics. I also volunteered um, for a number of things within in the campus to try and improve the campus. Specifically, we didn't have any places for students to show their own artwork. We had no student art galleries. Now, as I understand it, we have two. And that came about not 20 years later, but that came about while I was there. We created two galleries for students to show artwork. That's just how I am. When I came to Sacramento to go to grad school and work, I had no intention originally of moving home and running for office. You know, and I threw myself into things here. I was on uh, the board of the, the Latino Junior Golf Association for a number of years. I volunteered as a basketball coach. I volunteered in a number of different ways here as well. So, you know, kind of that's just my, my passion. That's my public service. That's what I do. I join, and it just so happens in this case, my passion and profession lined up. So, um, so I decided I would move home and I would run for office. And here's where the stand, and I, by the way, I was 30 or 31 when I ran, I was 32 when I got sworn in. Um, and here's where the story gets a little complicated. So I ran in my home district and it was occupied at the time by the current speaker of the assembly. Now, for those of you who don't know, the current speakers of the assembly at the time, not now, is generally a pretty powerful position, one that doesn't, you know, take well to being trifled with, so to speak. Um, and I, but it was term limit. So it's not like I was trying to take out the speaker. So I had the quote unquote temerity to run against the speaker's handpicked successor in his own district. Um, but in some ways that actually set me up for success because the speaker didn't view me as a serious candidate. And he cleared the field of a number of potential people who might've been a problem, but didn't bother clearing the field of me. So I stayed in and I had a one-on-one -on -one race against what I would describe as a weak opponent. Um, and I will tell you this flat out. Um, now I don't have a PhD, so I've never been through that. It was harder than grad school. I spent two years of my life just like, I mean, it was 16 hours a day, um, you know, running for office. Um, you know, there were highs, there were lows. Um, you know, it, it's not for the faint of heart. And there's multiple ways to run for office. That's, I guess that's the thing I would say is also, it's like snowflakes. 
Um, so, you know, before I kind of detail my personal experience, the one piece of, you know, a couple pieces of sage advice that I would give to people, um, and I think you kind of maybe even see that with me and Michaela, although I've never met her and don't know her story, so I'm speculating based upon what I just heard. Um, you know, you have to figure out what resonates for you. I didn't want to run for school board. I wasn't interested in education policy. Um, you know, you have to figure out what's true to you, because I think that is what's going to work. In my experience, if you have a checklist, if you get to the age of 21, 22, 25, 26 and say, I want to do this, unless that is just such an overwhelming, powerful thing, you, you're probably not going to be successful or be happy if you're living your life based on a checklist. Because certainly if you went back to the time when I, before I ran and said, create a checklist of running for office, being a photography major at UC Riverside probably wouldn't have made that checklist. But I did it because when I was at Riverside, that's what I ended up wanting to do. Um, and so you go through these things, you know, moving away and then moving home. There's a whole lot of things that would be on the proverbial so-called checklist. Um, so you do what you want to do. And when it came time to run, you know, you find the office that you want to run for. So if it's education, then it's a school board. And I actually have a friend here in Sacramento. She loves education. She's been on one of the school boards up here for many years and has no desire to move up. She's had opportunities. No, I like this. This is what she wants to do. It's not about a power play. It's about contributing in a place that she wants. Um, you know, and so I think that's important. Figure out what resonates with you. Probably not going to run for Congress, at least not in California right away, but possible. Um, but figure it out. Is it, is it the, you know, is it the school board? Is it an irrigation district, a flood control protection district? What is it that you want to do? And then why? Question your own motivations because you need to figure that out to understand why you're running. Because you're going to get asked that question, why are you running? And you have to have that, what I'll plagiarize the term origin story as to what is your motivation for doing it. And you have to be sincere about it. And you have to in, you know, ingrain it into you. It's got to be part of your ethos and you have to feel it. Um, and if you can't, you'll get probably get found out. I'm not saying everybody does, but if you're not really if you're not really in it, you're not probably going to do that well. Um, so for me, that's that's kind of, you know, my, my advice is be genuine to yourself, figure out what you want to do, and don't make running for office the be all end all at the end of that tunnel. Because frankly, it, I don't remember the number anymore. When I was in the legislature in the entire history of California, there'd been like 3,000 people plus who had served in the state legislature. I hadn't get, got, yet gotten to 4,000. So if you're planning on being one of 4,000 out of however many hundreds of millions of people or tens of millions of people who have ever lived in California, statistically, the odds aren't really good at that. Um, so figure out how you're going to give back and see where it goes from there. Like, and I, I guess that's, I, and, and I know that sounds like a strange thing for how to run for office, but my first advice is don't plan on running for office because it's not necessarily the likeliest path that you're gonna take. Um, I, I will just flat out tell you right now, I'm a, a lucky statistical anomaly. Yes, I mean, I'll, yes, I'm smart. Yes, I was really hardworking, but I'm also a statistical anomaly. So that's my sage advice there. So for my story, um, you know, it was, it was lots of hard work. It was, uh, you know, trying to get endorsements. It is, you know, it, it, there's a lot more nuts and bolts than you would think to do. There's a lot more science to it. Um, identifying the voter roll, who is gonna, who is the likely voter turnout. We have the, the non-electoral professionals have a notion of what it's like to run for office that isn't necessarily true. So my district, I represented 450,000 people. That was the total number of people approximately approximately who lived in my district, somewhere between that and 500,000. But of those, and I used to be able to tell you this off the top of my head, I can't anymore. The percentage of people who are registered to vote went, you know, total population registered to vote went down to here. Democratic primary went down to here. Then you have to throw out all those people who are unlikely to vote. And you don't want to waste money talking to those. And you'll hear people, oh, I want to talk to everybody. No. Past behavior is the predictor of future behavior, okay? If you've, been, if you've spent your entire career in college getting Cs, B minuses, and D plus, the likelihood of you becoming a straight A student in your last year is really minimal. It's possible, but really minimal. And if I'm gonna bet on somebody who's gonna be the straight A student, it was the person who got straight A's last year. Same thing with voting. If I'm gonna to look to who I wanna to talk to about Lloyd Levine, I'm gonna to look to people who voted already and have a history of voting. So there's, there's identi so there's that level of electoral science. Then there's the thing that everybody loves. Their favorite thing is raising money. And you have to
campaign was over a million dollars. My assembly campaign was probably six hundred thousand dollars or more. Um, so you know that that's a challenge. And then you're going to be disrespected. Um, you know, you'll call your best friend who you've been best friends with since freshman year and try and get him to give you the five hundred dollars that you know that you know or whatever it is or her that five hundred dollars that you know they can give you. And you'll have to call them for like three months before they run, finally write the check. Then there's other people who are going to really surprise you, people you don't know. You've really barely met. You maybe know them a little bit. Your next door neighbor's uncle happens to be over and you're talking to them and they're like, oh, I'll give you $3,000 like, because that happens too. Not very often. Um, then there's the one that, that I always use as an example. When I was running for Senate and this was, I was an assembly member. Um, like member of the California State Legislature, which is the largest electoral body in the United States other than Congress. And I'm calling people, you know, yes, this is assembly member Lloyd Levy. Yes, I, I, I did call last week. Yeah, yeah, could you just have him call me back? Like, they're, like when you're not running a, in a competitive race, everybody is your best friend and wants to talk. Running in a competitive race, you will spend weeks trying to get people on the phone who last year were slapping you on the back, taking you out to drinks, et cetera, et cetera. I use that proverbially. I did not go out to a lot of drinks with people. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a huge challenge. Um, and I'm not meaning to make this sound daunting. Um, it is daunting. It's a lot of hard work and the payoff was incredibly rewarding. Um, I got to spend six years as a member of the legislature passing incredible pieces of legislation that to this day make an impact and to this day I'm proud of. I, I said when I was running for office and in my inaugural speech, and throughout my career, I didn't want to spend six years tinkering at the margins, and I didn't. I would rather take a big swing at a big pitch and miss than not try it at all. Um, so I, I don't want to make it sound like, oh, my God, I'm going to do all this work and it's not worth it. It's just I just don't want anybody going in with their eyes closed when you're running at that level, um, you know, or really at any level. It's a lot of hard work. People are going to want to talk to you. People are going to be disrespectful to you. You might knock on their door. You might have them identified as a likely voter, and they're just going to yell, "Go away!" Um, you know, in you know, it, it, it's so. I mean, the the subject with which I'm and I'm going to wrap up here in a second with which we're having this conversation today could, in and of itself, be its own master's program. How to run for office? You know, you could you talk about fundraising, you could talk about endorsement meetings, um, you know, you have the visual image of, oh, those lazy legislators up there playing golf, and there I am at 1030 at night in my Toyota Prius driving back on the 101 from Oxnard, where I was in somebody's living room meeting with a group of six or eight people who were the Stonewall Democratic Club of Oxnard, California, because I really wanted their endorsement, and I'm like, this isn't this isn't the perception. This is retail politics. This is me going to meet with a group of people in their own house, ask, telling them who I am, what I stand for, and why I should run for office. And that's that's really what it is. It's just, it's 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 a lot of hard work to raise the money, to garner the support. Um, honestly, by the end, you're exhausted. Um, you know, and and probably will get sick right afterwards. I did, um, and so. I'm trying to think if I've missed anything. That's kind of the high level. I mean, I can talk you through everything as to like, here's what you need to do. Here's who you need to call. But, um, you know, I, I just kind of want to try and give a realistic picture because what you see in the movies isn't real. You don't just show up, give a bunch of speeches, have everybody cheer you, call people and dazzle them with amazing rhetoric. Like, you'll get doors slammed in your face. You'll get hung up on. They don't care who you are. They don't care that you're a member of the legislature. I'm not even talking before you get there. You know, um, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and these are people your, that are your friends, your neighbors. I'm not talking about, you know, people from California running for president and talking to people in Arkansas. I'm talking about running in a district where you're talking with your friends and your neighbors. Um, so I think I'm just going to, that was, I just feel like I wasn't as articulate as I would have liked to have been. I feel like I was a little scattershot in what I had to say because there's so much to cover. Um, but the essence of this is it really is at least, and I can't speak because I've never run for anything between student council and state legislature. I never ran for a local office. Um, and I, at the level I, I ran for, it was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life, at least in a professional sense. Um, grad school was not as hard as this, and it wasn't really even close. Um, you know, so that, that, that's, that's it.
Thank you so much, Lloyd. Um, and for those of you who are taking notes or having questions, um, just know we'll be going into breakout groups. So you'll have an opportunity to ask all those questions to both speakers. Um, Michaela, what inspired you to run for office and your experiences? Um, I think to the point that was made, I'd never planned on running for office. Um, it was never on my radar really. I work my day job, I do work with leg state legislators across the country on how they fund education. Um, so I see a lot of the inner workings and I see the frustrations that sometimes occur um, when you're trying to persuade legislators, state legislators to come up with certain policies. Um, but again, I, at that point, I never, that kind of deterred me from ever wanting to run um, to Lloyd's point, like a lot of staff just don't feel that urge. Um, but I moved back to Lake Tahoe in 2018 and was working with the state of Nevada for a while. So I was like, oh, well, I'll just live here and work remote. And so I came back and we are governed by an improvement district, which basically handles, we handle all of our water, our trash, um, sewage, and then we handle all recreation. So we own beaches, we own ski resorts, we own golf courses, um, we own community programs, rec centers, all of those things. And um, I grew up going to all those places because it's the town I grew up in. And we had a switch on our board where people were trying to kind of get rid of some of these assets and not have it as community focused, et cetera. And so I felt like it was really frustrating to watch and I didn't really know how to approach that. And so when there was an open seat, I ran for um, the appointed position and it was a two, two vote between me and another woman. We went to the County. Uh, it was a two, three, three vote there. And then the governor appointed her. Um, and so then we, uh, we came time for the election and I was like, well, I have to run. I have no idea how to run an election or had ever thought about running an election really. Um, again, the nice thing about my role is I think it's about 20 hours a week. So I still get to work my full-time job um, with the exception of like taking some time off, but it works great in that sense. And so, but I had no idea how to run an election. And so I spent a lot of time working with people in the community. And as Lloyd mentioned, you're really just talking to people you know kind of well or know of you or are in your community and they're your neighbors. Like it's not so much always random people. And of course there are random people in there. But I mean, a lot of times you're being judged and asked to talk to people who know parts of you or know so-and-so who know so-and-so. And so I think for me, um, it was just, it was a huge learning curve. And at Lloyd's point, I think it was the hardest thing I ever did. I, you're spending hours going to meet with people, figuring out who to meet with. Um, we knocked on lots of doors. We had, we did a lot of signs. We did handouts at, at the post office. Um, and then just meeting with any group that's like, hey, can you come to my backyard and we can talk? Or, hi, would you like to grab a coffee? We do these coffees in the parking lot. Do you wanna come here? So it was a lot of just, um, really just adjusting your schedule to just meet with as many people as you could and really telling them like why you're interested. And what I realized, um, and that was really beneficial for me is I wanted to run because I had loved the way the community was and I was worried about how it was changing and how I didn't agree with it. And it was really easy to be passionate about that because that's how I really felt. And so having the purpose to running, not just to run or not just to be in that position, I think made it really interesting. And I think I spent a lot of time too getting to know all of our staff and understanding like what each department does. And so I went and got tours of all of our departments. So I really understood like what their issues were and where their problems were. Cause a lot of it, I didn't know just from being in the community. And so I think it was really finding like areas that I saw like needs for improvement and areas that um, I wanted to see better and that I felt passionate about. And if, and it also made it easier in the sense that if I didn't win, at least I was really honest to my values of what I cared about and that that's okay if that wasn't what the community wanted, but it was what I had really cared about. And so I think for me, it was really trying to then get out and get to know everybody. And I think that part can be really exhausting. I had a friend who ran for school board uh, in Colorado and he told me that like at the end, you're gonna be so over it. And it's true, like you're getting invited to your next place and you're like, oh, I really just wanna sit on the couch and watch a movie. <laughs> like, I don't wanna go talk to all these people I don't know again. Um, but it was great. And it was really, it was really interesting because I think 
I was always worried about the asking for money part. And I think that is somewhat times the hardest part. But as Lloyd said, people will truly surprise you and they'll be like, oh, here's this check. And I was like, oh, wow. And the people that you think that would easily donate, like I said, to start an email to everyone I knew of just like, hi, this is who I am, or I'm running, like I'd love the starter fund to start getting signs and get things going. And I feel like those are sometimes even the harder people to get the money from, like they'll end up donating, but it took a while where there's just random people who would be on my website and just be like, oh yeah, I'll donate to you. Or like write about something on our Facebook incline page and wanted to donate. So I think that part was really interesting. And I think that even though it was something that I never thought I would do and I didn't really know how I was doing it, it was such a great learning experience. The amount that I learned and the amount of time I spent um, getting to know people and just like learning how to run a campaign was really cool. It taught me a lot of skills, how to ask for money, how to get to know people, how to really define what my purpose was. And then to feel that I was really doing what I was passionate about and understanding like where my values were. And I think it was in that sense, uh, the most rewarding thing as well, but it was also I, I couldn't imagine how much work I was going to spend at it, but I really, I really did enjoy it. Um, if you would ask me like the week before election, I'm not sure I would have said the same thing, but no, it was really good. So I look forward to talking to you guys and answering questions. Great. Thank you so much, um, Michaela and Lloyd. Um, so I just want to say, Michaela, that was awesome. I loved hearing your experiences. Like, it's just really interesting to hear somebody else talk about it in that way, because usually I don't. You, we don't always talk about it like that. So it's great to hear that. Thanks. No, I, I liked hearing your experience, too. It was like, wow, it reminded me of so many parts of it that I feel like I'd blocked out. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm.